Mm-hmm. Hey, James, I saw that interview with the uh, Space Force Jason. gentleman. Yeah. yeah. Interesting concept. All right. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're live. Hey, everyone, no and way. thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. We are live again today with James from Invest Answers and Rob from Digital Asset News. And we are here to talk about the markets again. Uh, the, the markets have been fairly volatile recently over the last couple of days. Uh, fairly strong move by by Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin's kind of closing in on, on 42,000. Ethereum is already above 2,900. So we have a lot to discuss in today's video. Um, I, I will say, you know, if you're not already subscribed to, to James or Rob, make sure you go ahead and do so. You'll find a link to their channels down in the description below. So go ahead and go go subscribe to them. And and one of the, one of the reasons to, to subscribe, they produce a lot of other content besides this show, but we do this show every Friday, even though we don't do it on this channel every Friday, it does happen every Friday. So if you wanna catch that, you can, you can catch it on, on James's channel next week and then on, on Rob's channel the, the week after that. So the, the main things we're gonna talk about in this video, in this, in this stream, we're gonna first talk about the Bitcoin and Ethereum dominance, okay? And, and we're gonna talk about, you know, it's over the last year, it's more or less hasn't done anything. Yeah, it's just been kind of sideways. Over the last few months, we're in a local uptrend. We're gonna talk about what are the expectations as we head into the second quarter. We're then going to talk about like the blue chips in general, but also how does that relate to altcoins? You know, one of the things we know is that altcoins a lot of altcoins can do really well, but it's not always the same altcoins that do well. Whereas Bitcoin and Ethereum can typically put in new highs. Not all altcoins are, are going to put in new all-time highs. So what are some things you look for there? After that, we're going to talk about the pretty much undisputed fact that uh, April tends to be one of the better months for crypto. I mean, it, you know, is it going to play out like that again? It's hard to say. Obviously, there are no guarantees. But the worst April has ever been for Bitcoin has been a 3% drop. <laughs> That's the worst it's ever been in April for Bitcoin. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. And then following that, we are, we're going to talk about um, the stock market some. We like to talk about the NASDAQ, the S&P a little bit. And we know that they like to put in V bottoms, like commodities like to put in V tops and discuss the implications. You know, are we looking at a potential V bottom? The reason why we talk about this as well, not only do we like stocks, but it does affect crypto to some degree. You know, if equities are doing well, that can be a good, good thing for Bitcoin. We know that every Bitcoin's, every Bitcoin parabolic rally has occurred during a NASDAQ uptrend. And then finally... We're going to talk about, you know, as we continue on through 2022, what are the biggest, what are the biggest risks involved, and and what are what are the things to consider when investing in crypto in general, and and what are what are some of the things that are going to be sort of hanging over our head, and we have to constantly consider, okay, what is the risk involved with this? So that's the outline. I hope you guys, I hope you guys like it. I hope you guys enjoy it. And at the very end, we'll we'll go through a lot of questions, and um, and we'll we'll try to get feedback from the audience. So. The first question, and, and James, we're going to start with you, will rotate. So one of the things, we, and we talked about this before the stream started, the Bitcoin dominance, if you add it to the Ethereum dominance and you look at what sort of happened over the last um, over the last year, maybe I can even, even pull it up on my screen here. I have it on my screen so people can see. When you look at what's happened over the last year, it more or less has been going sideways, but it's been putting in lower highs. Okay, so it, you know, it, it was at like... 67% back in August of 2021 at a, at a high, then at 65%. Now it's at 62%. One of the things we discussed over the last three months or so is that we kind of expected in Q1 for the blue chips to outperform the altcoin market. And I, I think that has more or less happened if you just look at the last three months and, and look at the blue chips and how the dominance has gone up. However, what we want to really focus in on is what do you think going forward so like what do you think for q2 is is bitcoin and ethereum are they going to outperform the rest of the asset class if we kind of come out of this bearish time that we've been in or are they going to underperform and do you think we'll see altcoins surge once again uh, <laughs> interesting one it's funny i was looking at the uh i look at the bitcoin dominance a lot the eth bitcoin not so much but did have a look at uh Basically, since May 2021, you're right. It's been 40, 20, 40, 40% like ballpark, plus or minus 2 or 3% all the time. Um, <clears throat> I think 
hovering around that 60% since May 2021. Obviously, the first Q1 of this year has been different because there's been a flight to safety. Right. But I also think what's also happening is there's some, the, when we look at the other 40%, all the alts, excluding ETH, there are hundreds of new tokens coming on the scene every week. And they're sucking in a lot of retail with elaborate marketing schemes and pumping schemes and everything else. You see them time and time again. Now, I always felt that 2022 would be the year that DeFi and some of the, I hate to say the term metaverse plays, you know, the top three in each area will come into their own and the winners will become black holes and they will start making new all-time highs this summer. And I think also the merge for ETH should help it go deflationary, but I'm still a bit concerned about the speed of Ethereum. I'm very, uh, I, it, it is still the 800 pound gorilla that is everywhere. It's omnipresent, but um, I think it will make a new all time high. I think ETH will definitely hit 5K, but there is a huge amount of reliance on the layer twos and ZK rollups, et cetera, for it to be successful. And that's one of the things that I, I don't really like about it. Now, net net, in summary, I think, <laughs> sorry for being long winded, I do see ETH dominance waning a little bit. I see Bitcoin dominance range between say 40 and 48% and the top L1s increasing in market caps. And that will eat away at a little bit of the ETH dominance. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Bitcoin dominance going to say 46, ETH dominance going to 16, and a couple of the big new murderers row layer ones taking more market share. Okay, so basically you think Bitcoin's probably going to more or less stay where it is. And if anything, Ethereum might give up a little bit of its a little bit of its market share to some of the main some of the big L1 players in space. No, I, I think it, w with some good news, Ethereum or Bitcoin could go back to that 48% dominance, which means going up a lot. And then the rest of the market will follow. There's always the lag between mm -hmm. Bitcoin running and then the alts running. Yeah, I mean, it's really healthy for the market if Bitcoin can run first, if, if, if history is any indication, right? It was the parabolic rally by Bitcoin in late 2020 and early 2021 that sort of set altcoins up for, for months to come. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, Rob? Do you, do you think Bitcoin and Ethereum, you think they're going to sort of stay around their current market share, continue the slow uptrend, or do you think that uptrend is about to come to an end and they're, it's going to start going back down? I think... I mean, this really all comes down to uh, the macro, what's going to happen in the world itself. Because, I mean, you can, I mean, I've, your your model, the one that you have for the Bitcoin dominance, I had to pull up a, a coin gecko. It's it's pretty much the same with, with slight variance. And you're right. I mean, since January, you went from Bitcoin dominance of around 36, 37, and it's kind of just increased all the way up to 40, almost 41%. And I think the reason is because, People are, they are a little bit scared about what's going on. So what do they do when they get scared? Well, they put into things that are a little bit safer. So of course, you know, in the in the heyday, when you can make a ton of money on these degenerate plays, people would do that. But I think right now with what is happening in the world, I don't see it uh, turning around anytime soon for, especially with, uh, with Ukraine, especially with the Fed saying, hey, we're, we raised it a quarter uh, basis points and we're also going to do six more. I personally think they're going to, but I think mm -hmm. if, if people really want to really want to gamble, they can go outside that, but I don't see it, especially with you, you see the actual uh, revenue or the, the return on investment that's, that's been happening. I just, uh, I don't see it on as far as Bitcoin. Now, Ethereum, um, with with the way that it's going, everybody, everybody's built building on it. It'll probably go up, and I think James is right that there'll be a little bit of nibbling off of the of the market cap because it only makes sense you have those people that are coming there. But to the extent of how much it'll be, I couldn't really tell you. But I will tell you this: a lot of these, I mean, besides uh, Luna, some of these uh, these these L ones have uh, have massively gone down uh, since yeah. the beginning of the year. Yeah, and especially not only in their USD valuations, but their their valuations against Ethereum, their valuations against Bitcoin, uh, a lot of them are are down are down significantly. There are some layer ones that, as you said, that have done have done okay. Um, yeah, but it I is mean, it's well, interesting how yeah. how quickly they can bleed against some of the larger ones when when we're in a downtrend. Um, so this brings up another question because we're we're kind of talking about in you know Q two in general. And one of the things that we've we've sort of discussed a little bit before is 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 how, you know, in 
in January, one of the things we've seen, and actually let me let me pull up the chart here so that people can actually see it and, and follow along. We have this monthly returns table. And, and you know, these things aren't things you can take to the bank, right? No one's gonna cash this in and say you're gonna see 30% gains by Bitcoin in April. But one of the things we notice is that if you just look at the chart, and one of the things we've said before is typically after a red January, you get double digit gains in February. <coughs> Not all the time, but a lot of times. March ends up being usually red. But what's interesting is that April tends to be really good. So the question is, is will will April, do you see April being a relatively good month? I mean, we're only, you know, we're only a couple weeks away from it. To give you guys an idea of some of the returns that Bitcoin has previously seen in April, in 2020, Bitcoin went up 34% in April. In 2019, it went up 29%. In 2018, which was a macro bear market, it still went up 32% in April. In 2017, it went up 25% in April. I mean, in 2013, 46% in April. In 2011, it went up a very modest 418% in April. So the, the question is, you know, when I look at this chart, I see the downside historically in April is has been capped at around 3% to the downside, but the upside is often double digits. Do you see Bitcoin setting up for that right now? And the, and the reason I say that is because, you know, the price action is somewhat interesting right now. We, we are seeing a little bit of strength, right? We're seeing a little bit of strength by Bitcoin. It's, it's you know, it's holding on to some levels that a, a couple weeks ago we probably would have been getting getting some selling pressure at. Do you think we're sort of working our way through the end of March in preparation for a fairly attractive April in terms of the gains? Or you know, are we looking at like one big fake out and it's just going to come tumbling back down in April? Rob, I'll start with you. What are your, what are your general thoughts right now going into, going into the, the beginning of Q2? First of all, I want to thank you for allowing me to use your website on my channel. <laughs> yeah, <probably. laughs> except, except for the fact when I show some things, I probably shouldn't have. But uh, it's, a great, it's a great website. But I will tell you this, like I was looking at this today and we were talking about it because I was I, I was thinking about, you know, U.S. investors and paying for taxes and April 15th comes around. But, you know, statistically, like you said, on this on this graph, I mean, on this this table, it looks fantastic, except for, I mean, 2011, that 418 percent. It's kind of a little bit of a of an outlier, but sure. Right. I mean, I'll take I'll, I'll I'll take April for for what it is. So. Uh, can this continue? I mean, like, like, I mean, just goes back to the, the last, the last answer. This is one of those. This is the strangest time, or the most unique time for crypto and digital assets. We've gone through um, these four-year cycles. We've gone through a pandemic. We've bought, gone through some some downturns. But have we really gone through, as James will point out, stagflation? Have we gone through? Uh, I mean, a legitimate potential to uh, world wars and. And, uh, and have, have we gone through like where we are seeing like some really economic hardship across the board? I don't think we ever have uh, like in the situation. So April will be an interesting time to see if Bitcoin blasts through. I will say though, we take a look at the, at the NASDAQ and James pointed out this out in, in the S&P 500. I mean, they're up pretty good today. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the market wants to rebound. It wants to run. The question is, is really, can it do it? So in April, I'm hoping I'm hoping for the best, but I'm preparing for the worst. That's a great way to say it. Yeah. You know, I, you have to imagine that at some points after a long downturn, the sellers are going to have to get exhausted at some point in the short term. It doesn't mean we can't put in a macro lower high eventually, but at some point you would expect some type of a balance and get at least some type of relief rally. To, to, to give a little bit of perspective, you know, if Bitcoin goes up around 20% from the current prices, it puts it back at 50K. You know, which is, I don't think a lot of people have really considered or are necessarily prepared for. I, it's easy to, to kind of lose, lose that sight when you're in a downtrend. You know, again, when you're in a downtrend, it's hard to imagine Bitcoin ever going up. When you're in an uptrend, it's hard to imagine it going down. But what do you, I mean, what do you think, James? Do you think we are, you know, as you look across the markets, not just crypto, but I mean, I know you're, you're fairly well versed in, in a lot of markets. Do you, do you th see things kind of setting up for a, a decent rally? Uh, in a few weeks, and you think that will be reflected in the price of Bitcoin? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, the numbers I always look at is uh, I, I didn't I didn't notice you were sharing a table, but March average is eight percent, and April thirty eight percent. Is yours approximately the same as that? Um, the returns? I don't know exactly what it is, but it's so April. Yeah, historically, is a bumper year, whether or not it's a bearable market, and we don't even know what we're in right now. Everything is just so different. I think the key level is if we can get above forty-five k, 
there's nothing but fresh air between 45K and 50K. So we could very easily rally even overnight $5,000 candle up to that thing. But we've hit the 45K level, what, three times now? Right. And it's like a piece of glass that can't be broken. But if we took a good run at it, and it could even happen this weekend, I did say last time we were all together, I said I had a feeling the weekend would be bullish, and it was. Um, and I just think... I think the world is waking up and this is not really, I used to call it a money flow game, but now it's an adoption game. And if you look at all of the on-chain data, everybody's just nibbling at it and gobbling up as much Bitcoin as they can. And it will one day become that flight to safety, but that day may already gradually be here. So, <clears throat> and getting to, as I said, getting to 50K is very, very probable, probably could even be a lot higher in April if we get a historical April. But the, as, as Rob said at the beginning, peace is the macro issue. Um, it all depends on is there an escalation in Ukraine or do we solve that problem? And then there's rumors of some, I don't know if it's FUD or not, but I saw some things flying around Twitter that uh, China is now supporting Russia from a military perspective. Mm. It sounds like complete BS to me, but you never know what could happen. It's a crazy world out there. So that's the only thing. If there is peace, we are going above 50K in April. Strong words. Um, yes. <laughs> I'll take, I'll I'll take, take peace, I mean, I'll take peace and regulation. Yeah, I'll take, I'll yeah. take 50K. And, and, and the, the regulation I'm not that concerned about because all the earmarks I see are pointing in the right direction. And you have people like Elizabeth Warren embarrassing herself live on TV the other day. So um, I think I think there's been a, a big bifurcation as well within the leadership of politics, you know, between what happened in Europe this week, um, within the Senate, Congress, everybody's coming around to crypto. You can't kill it. You can't ban it. Embrace it and move on. Everybody's coming around except for Gary Gensler. <laughs> I think everyone will come around eventually. Uh, or at least yeah. the people that don't come around will just become less relevant, I think. Um, and, and remember, yeah. Gary's very pro Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So you know, he gave classes on it at MIT for a long time. So, right. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the okay. So, so, so we have the blue chips, right? We have we have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum. I think you know, no matter what market we're in right now, whether whether it's going to be a while before we put a new all time highs, whether it happens next month or in Q three or in twenty twenty three. I think a lot of us would at least be in agreement that Bitcoin and Ethereum will at some point put in a new all-time high, even though we don't know exactly when it'll occur. So, but that's something to, to think about, because one of the things I, I see people say is, well, you know, they're going to hold on or they're going to keep buying certain altcoins. And, and look, there's a lot of great altcoin projects out there, a lot of great ones. And as, as, as James said, there's probably going to be some that are going to nibble away at, at some of the market share of, of some of the larger cryptocurrencies. But with that said, we've learned some brutal lessons of the past. And that lesson is that not all altcoins will return to their glory days, right? Not all altcoins will That's return. Right. Yeah, you go back and look at 2017, 2018, uh, you know, a lot of people that joined in 2021, you might not even recognize some of the cryptocurrencies that were in the top 10 back then. So it's just mm. something to consider. So when we think about you know, building a portfolio or, or preparing a portfolio for a future rally, and, and, you know, you, we, we want to be Bitcoin, we want to have Bitcoin, we want to have Ethereum. What are you looking for with altcoins? You know, I mean, because, again, you say you think you think some L1s are going to take some market share from Ethereum. Uh, what do you think is are some of the big things to look for? But what else? And well, so what would be some red flags to, to sort of stay away from? Because we've been in the market for a long time, all of us here. We've, we've seen projects sort of go up and then never return again. So what do you guys look for? Rob, why don't we start with you on this one? Well, I'll just give everybody uh, one of my my. My favorite examples about uh, products that just go up and then never return, and I call it a dash of salt. So if you take a look at two projects, dash and salt, and you'll see just how uh, unbelievably, not horrific, but just how bad it was. Dash did come out back a little bit, but it was like, if you take a look, let me see, it went all the way up to $1,400 at, at its peak. And then it bought, and then it created out in January at 330, and it went sideways at 70, 100, 110. It peaked up again at 300, and now it's back down to 96. And you know what's crazy about this one? Uh, it is ranked 81 on on market cap. So all the ones I'm not here to pick on any project. Maybe I am, but that's one of them. And I'm like, that's still an that's still an 81 
as far as market cap goes, and it's still, I mean, still up there in the top 100, which I know there's other products that are, that are better than that, but that's just what it is. And then salt, I mean, salt went all the way up to Pete's sakes, 15 bucks. Now it's like a couple of pennies. Eight nine cents. So, like, even if we talk about like like I talk about dollar cost averaging all the time, you can't dollar cost average your way out of that bag. It just doesn't work out. So, at some point, you got to you got to cut those losers because they're not coming back. Maybe some of them do, but how long you want to wait? So, when we talk about these things about you know, you can get into these different layer ones, you get like like a Solana, like an Avalanche, like whatever else. You can do that, great. But the question is, how long is are those going to pop off as a pair as compared to the the big ones, which are Bitcoin, Ethereum? I always see it as this: Bitcoin, Ethereum pop off first. So you put your, I put my money into those things. Once those pop off, I take I take the profits. I have cash on the side. And if I want to, I can get on the other side. And then I just wait for the other alts to run, and then the cycle just repeats. And but the big thing is like, what do you look for? I always talk about the UTT, the utility. It does, what does it do? Is it special? The tokenomics, who's dumping on me? And then uh, uh, the team, are they actually good? I've done something before. Right. I, I think those are, are great things. Did you, did you, another one I you, you reminded me of when you were talking about Dash and saw EOS was another one that was like up there at the top. <sighs> I think it was like number Remember? four at one point. They had like such a huge ICO and then you never even hear about it really anymore. It just sort of slowly, slowly went away. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the Bitcoin forks do the same thing, right? Like I mean, I don't even want to say their names because I, you know, they, they just sort of slowly, they just sort of slowly disappear. Um, I mean, those are all great points. Do you do you look for similar things, James? Like, do you uh, do you, you know, do you look at the community or the, the team behind it? Uh, what what do you mainly look for when when you're looking at these altcoins? It's funny. There's somebody in the chat talking about Bitcurt. So there's there's all this crap going on that this Solana killer called Bitcurt. It's a freaking fraud. And this is the world we live in, everybody. So just be careful with the crap out there. It's all garbage. But I totally agree with what you both have to say. So I, I th- I'll take a very simple stance. And first and foremost, it all has a lot to do with technology and advancements in blockchain. So the Ethereum launched in 2015, XLM 2014, XRP 2012, Cardano 2017. But if, if you take five years in blockchain, that's like 50 years in other spaces. The pace of development is absolutely staggering. So even just looking at the stuff that ZK Rollups are doing today, just in the developed in the past six months, it's unbelievable. Anyway, all new chains, I believe, launched over the last 24 months are better, cheaper, faster, easier to build on, attracting more developers. Um, and then some chains boast TVL records and growth rates, but you've got to dig into what they mean. And I'm not going to mention any names, because I don't need to, but you've got one one group, they're boasting they have this huge percentage of growth in TVL, but the total TVL is less than one one thousandth of the amount of TVL locked in DeFi. So it's all, it's all just, people just don't look at the numbers, they look at the headlines. And I did a video on that recently too. Anyway, it's all about tech, tech adoption, flexibility, ease of use, ease of building, integration, daily active users, transactions per second. You look at all the stuff, and it's pretty easy to identify the winners. Now, when you look at, you guys are mentioning some historical names. I believe there are names that will never make it back to all-time highs, like Filecoin, ICP, Dash, EOS, IOTA, Flow, Algorand, BSV, Ethereum Classic, XLM, XRP, Theta, Cadena, Shiba, Cardano. I, I don't know if they'll ever make it back. Um, they might if the market goes completely bonkers. Right. But I also think as well, the yardstick we use to measure these chains has also changed because some people still measure everything against Ethereum because it is that 800 pound incumbent. But I don't know if that's a valid yardstick to measure things against anymore as well. So we'll see. But the good thing though is using Ethereum as a yardstick to measure other names is super interesting, which I know you do like right. XXX versus ETH on your chart and look at it bleed every day, making, you know, 52 week lows all the time, all over the place. So it is a fascinating world, but I urge everybody out there, be careful of scam coins like this BitCurt example, and be careful of things that aren't keeping pace with the development in this space because it is completely staggering. Well, I think one thing to consider too is just because it goes up in price in the short term does not mean it's not a scam. You know, that, I think a yep. lot of people sort of lose sight of that and they they feel that FOMO because it's going up, but 
it's not, I mean, you can orchestrate that kind of stuff and, and people do orchestrate that stuff and then they, they dump it on you just when you think it's, <laughs> you know, it's not a scam. So no, yeah, be very careful. I think that's, James hit the nail on the head. Be very careful about some of these altcoins because you never really know. Another, uh, one of the red flags I've seen with some projects are, you know, it's always sort of taboo when, when developers talk about, you know, what their share is in the cryptocurrency that they're creating. Uh, but at the same time, you want them to have exposure because that you want them to have skin in the game to keep growing it. One red flag that I find uh, that I find is is when the main developer sells their entire stack. I always run the other way at that point, no matter what excuse it is. This this happened. Great example was Litecoin in 2017. I had a big Litecoin <laughs> stack back then in 20, and and it did pretty pretty well back then. You know, Litecoin did really well back then. The main developer, the main developer sold yeah. his entire stack. So so did I. You know, again, I I I, I have the Conviction that if they don't have the if they don't have the courage to hold it, then then I'm not going to either. Um, Charlie Charlie Lee was was the greatest uh, investor of all time. I mean, so he, he, nailed the top. he basically sold. Yeah. He the nailed top. the top. He did. Yeah. <laughs> you um, could also say he nailed the top of the top of the bull market as well. Yeah. That yeah, guy did great. Perspective. And you know, so. they always, there's always an excuse, right? Like, so they can focus better. No, at the end of the day, it's they they've been <laughs> they've been building it. They they saw it go up 100x or something, and they they want to cash in before it goes back down. Um, no. so, so, so no. the next, the next, the next question is, and I want to, I want to sort of shift gears a little bit because we, we want to have like a more encompassing view on these channels, right? We want to talk about the stock market some, not just focus on only crypto because we know a lot of these things are intertwined to some degree. I mean, they're not like, there's not exact correlations between them. It, it actually, if you go look at the correlation between Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price and bear mark and Bitcoin's bear markets and the S&P, yeah. I believe one bear market was negatively correlated, one was positively correlated and one had no correlation. So there, there's not an exact correlation there. But again, anytime Bitcoin's gone parabolic, the Nasdaq has been in an uptrend. So that brings me to my, my next question. Commodity is often put in VTOPs, but equities often put in V bottoms. And the question is, when we see the NASDAQ and the S&P with these very strong looks to be an engulfing candle, do you think this is a V bottom? Like, do you think we are, are sort of, we've already hit the bottoms, we've already sort of scraped the lows, and, and we're just going to slowly trend higher from here? Um, and then if you do think we're going to trend higher from here, how, how, how strong is your conviction in, say, putting in a new all-time high in the next few months? Or do you think we're going to, you know, interest might wane as we get into the summer and then pick, pick things back up closer to, say, like Q3, Q4? Um, why don't we start with James on this one? Yeah, well, for the audience, I, I like, Ben, your approaches. I follow the money. I don't care if it's investing in tiddlywinks or wheat or nickel or stocks. But just identify where the money's going to go and try to get in there early. So that's why one of the reasons why I'm a huge believer in crypto, because a lot of money is going to flow in there. And we ain't seen nothing yet. Now, in terms of equities, and you said like kind of V-shaped bottom, I do believe on the commodity side, we saw some V-shaped tops. I nearly shorted oil, but I was out of margin. Um, wheat, et cetera, yes, uh, they definitely showed that. But when you look at the top tech stocks, it's, it's pull out tech stocks for a second, you talked about NASDAQ, but the, the staggering stat that the people need to know is the top 1% of the S&P 500, which is five companies, generated 40% of the gains over the last decade. That's Apple, Microsoft, Google, Tesla, NVIDIA. That's it. If you're not in those five names, you're going to, you're just, you're not going to do well at all. Now, the other there's the other 495 names, and there are some winners in that too. So if you go to the top 10, it's very different. But uh, right now, when we look at what happened in the market, you look at names like NVIDIA, it had a quintuple bottom since the beginning of this year. So did pretty much Google, Tesla, Amazon, MicroStrategy, but MicroStrategy is tied to uh, Bitcoin, of course, it's a complete proxy. So, and in full disclosure as well, I'm heavy into Tesla, Google, Amazon, MicroStrategy, and NVIDIA. And I believe the S&P 500 of the next five years will be dominated by 10 names as well. But uh, I didn't see that V-shaped bottom you're talking about. And I, maybe on the weekly it does exist. But I do think there was so much uncertainty because of the backdrop of geopolitics that we didn't quite get there. But the names that you all need to be in are names that are completely recession-proof and will crush earnings no matter what or get adopted no matter what. And that is, for example, Tesla is a prime example. I mean, they don't have to market their cars. They don't have to sell, you know, 
that sales forces or anything like that, it just sells itself and there's a backlog over 12 months. So and the valuation is stupid cheap considering the growth. So that's where people need to be. Same thing. That's why I'm so bullish on DeFi. DeFi is going to revolutionize a $400 trillion market. And that's the opportunity that's in front of everybody. But you got to be in the right names. Take that S&P 500 example. Five names drive 40% of the gainers. So if you look at, what, 18,000 cryptos now, take that same 5%, what are those 5% of those names? And then within that, it'll also be Pareto efficient. 80% of the gains will come from the 20% of that 5%. No, I mean it's these are, yeah. I mean these are like great points. It's like it's like do you want to be the person who who saw crypto sort of exploding over the next few years, but you bought five altcoins that just went to zero? You know, like ha- you have to you actually have to consider what are you putting your money in. Don't just throw it at anything because someone told you to. Right, blue chips and and get the get the ones you think will stand the test of time, which we we talked about earlier. How you can help identify those. Rob, what do you think? Do you think you think the uh, the stock stock market overall? You think it's it's primed for a, a push higher in Q two, or do you think yeah, it's so, still some uncertainty so, here? Oh well, it's uncertainty. But I was just gonna say like stock market's not my thing and commodities not my thing. But I remember I just I just had to look it up again. There was this this video on CNBC, and you can you can Google it right now. It's uh, Goldman Sachs Jeff Curry. I think he's one of the CIOs over there. He said that uh, we're at the beginning of a, of a commodity super cycle. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if, it, if that could be actually true. And I took a look at the question that you had today. And of course, we know how things are actually going pretty well, right? I mean, mm-hmm. even gold, for Pete's sakes, just matched its 10-year <laughs> ten year high. Palladium, platinum, silver, and of course, wheat and copper just crushing everything. So the, the question is like, if, if you take a look at what he, what he talked about and why it actually could be, I'm like, well, maybe this would be something that I, I would invest into. The problem is, is that I like to invest into things that I really know a strong amount about. So I'm going to bow out on this one. But I mean, for the stocks, there was just, I mean, I've invested in Amazon for the longest because I have a business on there. But I remember there was one good advice, which was, uh, this was in the army. One of the, one of the drill sergeants, they talked, they were talking about uh, investing as they were spoken us. They said, uh, you know, if you really want to invest in something, soldier, you should really just get into something that you actually know and actually use. And I was like, yeah, makes sense. That was in 1999. Ah, I should have invested in Google. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't win them all, right? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we have one more question and then, and then we'll actually take it to the chat after that. So... Look, crypto equities, they've all gotten hammered pretty hard over the last three months. And, and you know, while we are optimistic, I think a lot of us here are, are at least somewhat optimistic, potentially over the next few weeks, at least neutral, somewhat optimistic. But for the rest of the year, I mean, what are some of the biggest risks that you're considering? Because as we know, there's no sure thing, right? As much as we want to see Bitcoin go to 50K in the short term, there's no guarantees it's going to go there. If everyone thought it was going to go there, it would already be there. So, so clearly there's no, I mean, there's no guarantee that it has to go to these prices in the short term, even if, we, even if we think they will or even if we want them to. So what do you think the biggest risks are right now to the cryptocurrency asset class that we have to weigh in our considerations as we, as we sort of build our portfolio? Rob, why don't we start with you on this one? Yeah, and actually it goes back to, James had a guest on his show, a gentleman from uh, Space Force, MIT guy that was going into it. And he talked about how one of the big things was uh, just how you can manipulate the narrative around crypto and Bitcoin in general. And he talked about if you can get the, the community to lay down their arms, then you're going to win that war. And he said one of the wars that they're, they're trying to win right now is convincing everybody that Bitcoin is, is power intensive. And we have to ban it. And we just uh, avoided that uh, that that uh, uh, hammer falling not too long ago with, with the EU. Mm-hmm. So I think one of those things, and I've always, I've said this before, and people on my channel, most most kind of get it, but some just don't get it. when I talk about regulation. I think it is a bigger thing than what people can agree on. And I think that even though there's a lot of lot of uh, institutions that want to come into it, and James has talked about this before, where they have. They have uh, put in the paperwork and they have you know, stated that we're going to get into this type of industry. I think they can't go in, they can go in, but not heavy, heavy, like than they could because it's so risky of what they're getting into. So I think that is the, one of the big things. And like we talked about before is the war, but I mean, in the long run, I mean, if you look at it, if I always just look at things over like, like two, three, four years, where else are you gonna 
put your money into and have it work for you unless you start your own business and hopefully that works out. Right. But where can you put it where you can actually gain this many, this much percentage points? It's very tough to say. Uh, goes I, I don't know anything else besides this. Goes back to the Tina, right? There is no alternative when talking about US equities and, and people always go back to, I mean, this was again, I mean, precedes crypto for sure, right? But it's like, well, where else are you gonna put your money? You know, I mean, if you hold it in cash forever, it's just gonna go to zero. Uh, I mean, you can always hedge with things like precious metals, but again, those precious metals are likely not going to make you rich. They might, you know, they might just sort of hang around the same prices or and whatnot. So I mean, it's it is uh, something to always consider. Like there is no alternative. So where else are you going to put your money? James, what do you what do you think? So what are some of the biggest risks going forward, and and how do you sort of weigh those various risks when investing in crypto? Well, it's funny. I spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, psychology of humans and market psychology. And just what you hinted at there, Rob, for a second. But people love finding a narrative and threads and grand explanations, et cetera, because humans are somehow biologically wired to make sense of the world in that way. But humans, I think, confuse correlation and causation and zero in on evidence or data or a leader that supports their view and they shun everything else out there in the world. You see that in crypto, you see that with meme stocks all over the place. And I urge people to try revise, open your eyes and revise that way of thinking. But the point I'm trying to make here is uh, when it comes to market shocks, which I think is the big picture you're talking about is getting away from mentality. Market shocks are caused by surprises. Okay, now the Fed right now, Jerome Powell, he's very, very good at making sure the market is not rattled. He he telegrams exactly what it's going to do way ahead of time. So the Fed is factored in, and it's a nothing burger, as I say. 25 points, 50 points next month or eight weeks from now. Who cares? The market has it factored in. And remember, we're going from a zero-rate environment to a very low-rate environment, so it's a nothing burger. Second thing is regulation. Regulation is looking okay. Uh, folks like Elizabeth Warren have embarrassed themselves in their witch hunts against crypto and other stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think... That's going to impact the market at all. The biggest concern I have is the unknown unknowns, as we know, and that could be a surprise Russian escalation. It could be China invading Taiwan. It could be China helping Russia. Um, who knows what? And then we have a WW3 issue. That is the only thing that concerns me. When you look at the macro money that's on the sidelines looking for a home, people can't sit on cash. They have to find alpha. And there is 30 billion, 50 trillion, 100 trillion looking for a, 100 billion looking for a home right now. And, uh, or sorry, trillion. I, <laughs> there's just so much money on the sidelines. And if you look at gold today, gold is down 1.2%. Bitcoin's up 2.2%. You know, talk about precious metals and hedges. I think the narrative of, say, Bitcoin as an inflation hedge is actually catching on slowly but surely with the people who really hold the money. And the people who hold the money are the boomers, the people 56 plus. They own 1% of, what, what is the number? They own something like... 20% or 40% of global wealth and only represent 1% of the population. Some crazy stuff like that. I covered in the video a few months ago. But that's what we need to watch. Where does that money go? And watch out for any surprises that could rattle the markets. Yeah, the surprises are, I mean, they're so unpredictable. I mean, even going back to like February 2020, and I, I, I sometimes watch some of my videos that I was making back then, and we all felt pretty good, you know, and it was like right before the pandemic just came and washed everything out but then we got back up to the same price just like one or two months after that happened anyways um yeah so it, it is certainly something to consider all right why don't we turn it over to the audience if you guys have any questions for for robs or james or myself uh we have a we have about 10 more minutes or so we can we can get some of those questions answered so just leave leave a uh, leave a comment in the chat if you have anything specific um, that you would like to like to discuss so someone says if, if bitcoin gets rejected um, by the bull market support, and he's basically talking about you know forty five or forty three to forty six k. I know you mentioned forty five k being a pretty pretty significant level. So let's suppose let's go walk through a scenario. If it gets rejected by that level, and we come back down to say below forty k, do you think we're going to put in a lower low, or do you think we'll just kind of go sideways for a few more weeks and then try you know try try again? What do you, what do you think, James? Yeah, I tweeted this a week ago. 
I do believe we're going to break out April 1st above 45K, um, basically an Elliott impulse wave from the higher lows and then the 45K resistance. We have this channel that's just compressing. And we'll just tap it once or twice more and it should break out above 45K, then it's straight to 50K. And I know I sound like I'm overly bullish, but I just, I just, I just know how much money there is looking for a home right now. And there's very few places to park money. And the market cap of Bitcoin is tiny. It doesn't take a lot of money to move it when you consider the trillions floating around looking for that home. So that's why I am very, very bullish. And that is also represented by the supply being drained from exchanges. I mean, the HODL factor, you name it, any metric you look at, the greater than 10 Bitcoins or greater than 100 Bitcoins or uh, the HODLer is over a year, all metrics are pointing to very large accumulation right now. You know, I believe in, um, I don't remember exactly the date, but actually in 2019, we sort of had a, a very boring Q1 and it was right when April started that Bitcoin broke back out to the upside. By the way, back then it, it kind of went on a Bitcoin only rally when, when that happened. Uh, I know I know you're not you're not thinking that's going to happen this time per se, but uh, it is interesting to kind of reflect on, on what happened but it, back then. But it, it does lead because the big money, again, when you look at the big money, then I say the Bitcoin game now is 70 to 80 percent institutional. It's not retail. This is not driven by retail investors by no stretch of the imagination. Now, the big money that has tons and millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions to throw around, they're not investing in old coins. They might invest in Ethereum, but beyond that, they don't touch it. It's too risky as far as they're concerned. Therefore, I do believe as soon as the big money starts to flow, Bitcoin will pop first. The others will follow later. Right. I agree. And the, I mean, I think that's why we've, we've talked about the blue chips so much, right? Because it's like they tend to move first before the, before the asset class comes roaring back. Uh, James, there's actually a question for you by someone named Deep Blue Trader. I think this is in relation to maybe a, a recent video you did with someone. So I want to get this question asked. He said that, uh -huh. did you interview someone named Jason recently? Yesterday, yeah. Okay, yeah. So he says, he says I, I, I haven't seen it yet, but he says, does Jason's view views change your view that holding MicroStrategy or GBTC is a sufficient proxy for Bitcoin? Either can have their Bitcoin confiscated at any moment in the interest of national security. What do you think about that question? Yeah, I don't think that's a concern in the U.S. Uh, and we did we did go into depth about that. Is I, I speak always about the toothpaste being out of the tube. And people say, but technically you can put it back in. But I just think there's too much um, infiltration right now on Wall Street, on publicly traded companies, on miners, now on politicians. You look at the activities in Texas. Can you imagine what would happen if all of a sudden, I think 25% of the hash rate will be in Texas by the end of this year. And if all of a sudden some regulator in Washington said, hey, we're going to ban Bitcoin. And by the way, the billions and billions of dollars of miners and assets and market capitalization that are best in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of ASICs rigs, you got to cancel all that right now. There would be a revolt. And I think we're at that tipping point now where politicians are getting it. And slowly that infiltration all the toothpaste is spreading all around. So I'm not concerned about that. I have a very large uh, microstrategy proxy position, very large. It's a double digit Bitcoins in terms of value. So um, I'm not concerned at all. If I was in any way concerned, I wouldn't be in that position. Fair enough. What do you think? Uh, here We have a question for, for Rob here. Rob, what are you most bullish on? Uh, what crypto sec sector are you most bullish on? Right now, is it uh, metaverse, DeFi, <laughs> layer? What, what, do you have a do you have one that you're most bullish on right now? So, if you want to like, if you're talking about risk, I mean, the safest is one we've just been talking about like the last thirty minutes, right? right. Bitcoin and Ethereum. But if you if you're going to take a look at like, if you want to get a little risky <clears throat> and then invest in something, I mean, look, if you're looking at the UTT, the utility, the tokenomics, and the team, you take a look at utility and you can see like, well, what is this? What do these things do? I mean, play to earn gaming is going to be, it should be, probably be pretty darn big. The question is, is which one of those games are going to be enormous? And I can tell you right now, there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, the games that they have right now are stupid. They're awful. They have, the graphics are just ridiculous. So these are like main gamers wouldn't play that. But I've, I can probably say this. So I was invited to take a look behind the scenes at a game called Big Time. And it was a private meeting 
and I got to see what the graphics were and what they could actually do and actually in a real world gameplay. And it looks like exactly what you would find on like PlayStation 5 right now. It is, it is pretty darn awesome. So, and there's some other one that I can't say, but like those games will come along and you'll probably see a massive explosion because you've got the free to play games over here and people are spending billions and billions of dollars. I mean, Fortnite, just look how much that, that makes per year. They're going to come over here to go play to earn. I think it's going to be a pretty big play. Metaverse, I don't, it's weird because like that's a that's a very long-term play. So right. if I'm going to say like the most degenerate thing, probably play to earn. Yeah, the whole metaverse thing, like I, again, the, the definition of the metaverse is somewhat subjective, you know, but like in general, sometimes it feels like we're a bit too early for what people were imagining. <laughs> Um, especially, I'm not sure that the, the best models are, are, are the models that they have where basically everyone who's early just scoops up all the land and then just sits on it and waits for the other people to come. I, I don't know. But yeah, with, with regards to the games, I, problems with web three. Yeah. I mean, with regards to the gaming, I, I completely agree. And one of the things we've mentioned is it seems like up until recently, maybe, maybe we're finally trending in a different direction, but up until recently it was crypto people creating games to then have crypto integrated. It wasn't gaming people creating games to then have crypto integrated. And so I think that's the big thing. And, and you touched on, like you actually wanna see, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I was gonna say, that's what, that's what Polygon Studios is for. Polygon Studios exactly set that up to go, we're gonna reach out to these gamers, these, these gaming companies and pull them into the blockchain sector. And they've already got some really good ones already. So just look, if you wanna look at the next big thing, go follow Poly. Uh, Polygon Studios and see which ones they're working with right now. That would be my guess. Fair enough. James, did you want to take a stab at that question? I know nothing about games. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, but in general, but in general, do you have, are, is there a sector you're really leaning bullish on right now? Uh, in crypto? Yeah, specifically in crypto. All, yeah, all things DeFi. You got to follow the money. You know, the, how big is the know. gaming market, total addressable market? What is it? Maybe, a tr maybe half a trillion dollars globally? 400 billion, I'm not sure. But if you look at DeFi, DeFi is going after a $400 trillion market. Uh, and it's, like ripe, it's ripe it's for disruption. So uh, from that perspective, um, you know, all, anything that is the underpinning of this DeFi, TradFi disruption, that's what I've been bullish on. That was my thesis for getting into Ethereum um, a long time ago. And so we'll see. Yeah, so By the way, the market's looking crazy. Looks like we might see a three thousand dollar Ethereum and a forty two k Bitcoin pretty soon. Uh, the blue chips lead, as they say. I don't. I don't really know if the altcoins are following, but I. I would be happy if if they were leading. If the blue chips were leading. Um, let's Avalanche see. up eight well, percent. So. Okay, so is it is it back above eighty? Yeah, eighty six. Oh wow! Yeah, I just made a video on it like last night, and it was like seventy nine. So that's why it's pumping. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. I hope not. Yeah. Um, yeah so what was some other? Okay, so here, here's a question, uh, James. Why don't we go to you on this one? What are your thoughts about about uh, HBAR and Phantom from a tech perspective? Yeah, I don't like HBAR for a whole host of reasons. Uh, never did. I did uh, in my Shut Eye Buy series. I. Slated it pretty hard, and <laughs> that was it. Phantom, I do like their technology. It's as far as we are concerned, it's the fifth best L1 that's out there. Now, with all the disruption of Andre leaving, has caused a little bit of a ruckus mm -hmm. and is very weak. But I would not be selling at a dollar twenty or a dollar thirty. I ne wouldn't necessarily buy into it either. I do have a position, but I'm not selling at this level. Fair enough. Um, mm -hmm. What do you guys think about, I and mean, we have a conference, the, the Bitcoin Miami conference coming up in, in April. Do you think that's going to generate some hype? I see some people asking, you know, a lot of this stuff is narrative driven and like, you know, building some hype around things. Do you think that's going to, do you think the conference is going to build some hype around crypto and lead to price? It, it didn't last year. I don't think it will this year. It was kind of like what happens is the, the big moves happen before the conference. And then during the conference, people are like a little bit disappointed. Right. And then it fizzles out. So are we in that phase right now? Are we in that phase? Are we in the, the pre-conference pump phase right now? <laughs> could be, could be. But I, I don't think it drives too much action, to be honest. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't influence the decisions of the 70% of the money that's coming in. They're not deciding, oh, I'm going to get a ticket to the conference and I might deploy $100 million into Bitcoin. It's not related at all. Right. So. 
Um, it looks like people are asking about, because you mentioned the 5L, 501s, so naturally people are now asking the follow-up question, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we, we built a quant model early 2021 to identify the top layer ones, and it includes um, the, the different names. The so number one uh, was Ethereum up until it just flipped a week ago. Now it's number one is Solana. And we look at 20 quant points. This is nothing to do with anything but looking at daily active users and adoption and developers, et cetera, et cetera, speed, fees, all that type of stuff. So number one is Solana. Number two is Ethereum. Number three is Luna. Number four is Avalanche. And number five is Phantom. Okay, there you have it. All right, let's maybe see if we can get another. Here, here's a good question. And look, we, we've talked about this one before. And I mean, honestly, this Chainlink has, has been one of the worst performers. Mm -hmm. um, so someone says, do you think Chainlink is undervalued? Uh, let me see. What, do you think Chainlink is undervalued compared to its 58 billion TVS? And will it be, appreci will it be appreciated more when people have an overall better understanding of of crypto, they're saying that Link USD longs are are up today. So, what, I mean, what do you guys generally think about Chainlink? Because this is one, this is one I've held in my portfolio uh, basically since like 2017, and it did exceptionally well even during the bear market. But it's been pretty humdrum for the last, you know, for the last year or so. And I know we were all bullish on it before. Uh, it's gonna be difficult when you just watch it bleed against ETH. You know, I mean, it's down what like 90 percent against ETH over the last 18 months. You can't look at that and ignore it, right? You have to say, all right, well, what's going on? Is it, is it going to rebound? What do you guys think about it? I mean, is it is it is it undervalued, or is it um, or is it just kind of trending tr lo slowly losing value to other projects? Well, I actually covered this uh, very recently, but Rob, you go first if you have thoughts on Chainlink. Sorry, my internet's a little bit spotty, so I glitch. Yeah. Sorry, but uh, if if we're right that DeFi is going to be the, the, the next big thing in crypto, maybe uh, all those projects, they're all going to need some type of uh, Oracle to pull in off-chain data. So if that's the, that's the case, then you don't really have to pick the right winner. You just have to pick uh, the uh, spades and shovels uh, as, as opposed to like uh, picking their, the, the right uh, prospector. So Chainlink is one of those ones I've been dollar cost averaging now for over six months. And uh, I think it'll do well. It's just going to take time. And again, you don't have to pick the right winner. You just have to pick the ones that uh, have has the most utility. Right. James, what do you think? You think it's undervalued or is it it's just going to slowly slowly keep going down? Yeah, this is a classic, classic case in point of why you need to look at things like inflation. So Link is about 0.14% of my bag. Calculated it yesterday because somebody asked me a question on it. Uh, and it is the most incredibly valuable ecosystem you could ever look at. It is the number one Oracle. They have moats out the wazoo. The problem is they have a 27% token inflation, and this is suppressing prices as it go grows. And I do believe there are faster horses, but Link should fairly be valued about $40, $40. But because of the continued inflation dumping in the market, it's just killing the price action. So... It's just one of those things. It's been like that and Polkadot are the two biggest disappointments of my 2021. Right. Well, another <laughs> but thing, they are tiny, tiny, tiny positions. I'm heavy in three names, basically. Yeah, another thing about Polkadot is that really, I mean, a lot of the people that made the most money were the people that got in before it was like publicly listed because it had actually already appreciated a lot from the original price. And then it did a 10x after that. So yeah, it's it was funny because we were looking at some of the ROIs and a lot of altcoins from some of their, mar not all of them, there have been some that out outperformed. A lot of them have all seen similar type moves. They just all occurred at like different times. <laughs> um, exactly. And, and, and the ones that are occurring more recently, obviously people are more bullish on those because they've occurred more recently, but you never know. I mean, Polkadot can always pick back up steam and, and uh, push higher again one day, but... All right, I think um, you know we're we're basically at four o'clock. So why don't we go ahead and wrap it up there? If you guys, you know, if you guys want to check this the this uh, DCA uh, live next week, go check out James's channel, and then we're gonna follow it up on Rob's channel the week after that. So you can find the link to their channels down in the description below. So make sure you guys check that out. Thank you guys for coming on the show today, and um, we will see you guys next time. Forty-two k Bitcoin just happened. Good way to end it. <laughs> All right, see ya.